Right, so uh, I realize that most of you, especially in the EPUB program, have not really had any contact with the environmental side of issues, the biophysical reality, as I would call it. So I think that this is a real problem for economics, the way that economics is taught and the way that economics is actually being discussed. So social ecological economics is not just connecting economics to the environment, but also to social issues, because ecological economics has also ignored the social side, and that's just as important. And they actually match up and, and fit together. But also, everybody realizes, or everybody should realize by now, that the economy and the economic structure that we have cannot continue as it is. And more or less, everybody is on board on this. They just want different types of transformation. So a lot of people want transformation to save the system, transformations to the green economy, transformations to recreate the system and to actually stop inequity and disputes and wars and other things, right? But they want to maintain the system. Other people want to transform the system to something else. So what I want to do is actually run through why we have social ecological economics, why we need biophysical reality, why we need transformation, what transformation means. So what I'll do is I'll start out with giving you some basics on the biophysical reality. What do we mean by the biophysical reality? Why is this important for understanding economics and the structure of the economy? Then looking into why the social ecological aspects go together. And I use the example of climate change. So I'll focus in on climate change because I guess everybody here has heard about climate change. Right? Unlike most of the other environmental problems which you don't hear about these days. And then I'll look into why the biophysical reality links into the need for social issues, social and political issues to be taken on board. But also I will question the focus on climate change and the problem and see this in a broader context. Then I want to look at the way in which the environment is being discussed in economics, not just in the mainstream, but also by supposedly alternative economists and the way that this is actually what's called greenwashing. So, you know, we're washing over the real substantive issues and the need for systems change. And then I'll finish up with some thoughts uh, uh, reflections about alternative economic systems. I'm putting into context probably where you think you lie in terms of your economics that you've been trained in and where alternatives lie. And then we'll have a few conclusions. So to start with, the biophysical reality and the structure of the economy. I guess you've, you know, you've all done macroeconomics, right? So you all have a basic understanding of macro. Has anybody not done macroeconomics? Okay, everybody. So you're an unusual audience for me, because normally when I ask people if they have macroeconomics, it's a minority. So everybody has macroeconomics. So we go back, 1954. Here you have a standard textbook, features common to all economic systems. This is a description of all economic systems, according to these authors. Chapter 2, figure 1. What do we have? The circular flow diagram. Okay? This describes the world. It's a particular description of the world. This world only has two actors in it, a firm and a household. And this is meant to describe all economic systems. Not a particular economic system, all economic systems. Right? And of course it's matched up by the flows between the physical and the monetary economy. And this is the monetary circuit, the wheel of wealth as it's called. So what is going on with this diagram? This is a foundational diagram from 1954 which is describing and defining economic reality. It is telling you that this is applies to all economic systems. There is no other economic system except this economic system that has a firm and a household and that they interact with each other and they interact with each other in very particular ways with a flow of goods and services and labour and through money. And that's it. There's never any other economic system. Okay? Well, through history of thought, we should realise that this is actually a totally wrong conceptualization because the economic system it's describing did not exist until we got to the rise of capitalism in the 16th to 1700s in England. Prior to that, this economic system did not exist. So clearly, it does not describe all economic systems, as the textbook says. But let's come up more up to date, okay? A very popular textbook. This one says the Principles of Economics, the third edition, 2004. Chapter 2, figure 1. The same diagram, basically redrawn. So the same diagram from 1954, redrawn. And now we're told that this circular flow diagram is representing a representation of the organisation of the economy. A representation of the organisation of the economy. There is only one economy again, right? There's only one economic system 
and this is the representation of it. So again we see claims to being realist about the economy, this is the reality of the economy, and this is the way that we should understand what an economy is. But let's come even more up to date, 2015 edition, the seventh edition now. Chapter 2, figure 1. The same diagram, right? But now we're told this is thinking like an economist. Now this is an important <laughs> shift, right? So now we're no longer studying the economy and the reality of the economy. Now you're being told in a prescriptive way this is how you must think as an economist. So this is what economics is now. A prescriptive approach imposing how economists should think, but also imposing how you should think to be an economist. So if you do not think like this, if you do not believe that the world is made up of two actors, firms and households, if you do not believe that it's goods and services and money wages, and you do not believe in the monetary flow, and you have a different conception of an alternative economy, you're not an economist. It's as simple as that. So, let's take this diagram. What's wrong with this thing? The macroeconomics, the growth machine, okay? The growth machine is about circulation around this diagram. Getting this thing to go faster and faster, get the flows to go faster and faster, more and more growth, and that's what, the, that's what the, is being aimed for politically and has been around, uh, certainly since the post-Second World War era, as a major goal and strategy. What's wrong with this is that it has no inputs and no outputs. This is a totally unreal diagram. Basically, what it is, it's not describing a macroeconomy, it's describing an isolated system. And I mean isolated system in a pure physics sense. This is a system that has no interaction with any other system. Right? If this system was sitting in this room right now, you wouldn't even be able to see it, because it has no interaction with you and you wouldn't actually have any inputs or outputs coming from the system. It would be unidentifiable. Okay? So it's totally unrealistic. This is the describing an isolated system. No energy, no materials in this system. It just goes round and round. A failure to address biophysical reality. That's what this is. Economists being trained and told that this is the world, this is reality, this is the system, and yet it has no inputs and no outputs in it at all. And of course the real economy the actual economy has massive amounts of resource and energy extraction going on. So we've got mountaintop removal, we've got dams, we've got deep coal mines, we've got oil extraction, we've got clear-cutting forests, just to get the resources. The resources have to be transported and processed, so we've got a massive transportation network, we've got massive amounts of oil pipelines, of course we get oil spills, we've got shipping, we've got ga gas tankers, we've got coal trains, we've got these pipelines that have been going through, we've got the Germans strip mining to get their lignite out and you've got these massive oil refineries so this is part of the process and then what's it all for? resource consumption so what are we doing with these resources? lighting cities for 24 hours a day sending rockets into space flying, stretching stupid cars into unbelievable shapes and driving them around robotics, heating and of course the military and the military industrial complex, a whole range of things of consumption, right? So we're told in economics that we're efficient. Efficiency only goes as far as production. Is this efficient? What's it for? What's the consumption for? So if you look at the economy and the structure of the economy, you have to understand that there are inputs and outputs, right? And if you take the economy, so this is a slightly old diagram, it doesn't really matter, you can update it. What you'll see is that when you look at the raw material supply going through, and you look at the way the economy operates over time, when there's a downturn, there's a drop in materials. So, 1930s crash, right? 1980s crash. If you went in 2008, you see exactly the same thing. Every time there's a downturn, there's a drop in the material going through the economy. The economy is dependent upon the material throughput. That's what they say. You try to break the cycle. So there's been some attempts, okay, with the ideas of the, uh, of the uh, closure of the economy. Recycling. Recycling around since the 1970s is a, is a, a way in which we can actually do something about it, about the problems. And the recycling is a very small part of the material flow. You can see that recycling is actually extremely limited. So this is the idea of the currently closing the economy, closing the loops, right? But it's been around for a long time. You can give it a new name. It's been there for ages. 
And why is this not going to help us in a dramatic way? It's maybe a good idea, it's not a bad thing to recycle, but it's not actually addressing fundamental issues of the economy. Technology, <coughs> innovation, product lifetimes. So what we're told is that we should make products more durable, that if we had more durable products, then we would actually improve the situation as well. Okay? So let's look at some studies. A UN study, the estimated lifetime of some typical household uh, longer life appliances. So you can go through this. They're all about you know, four to ten years, all these appliances. So you take something, let's just take something like the mobile phone. Okay? Mobile phone, average lifetime expectancy, four years. So you could increase that lifetime. Would it help you? Well, the problem is not that the lifetime of the product, it's actually that we live in a society that throws things away. The growth economy is about getting rid of products. You've got to get rid of them to maintain the growth, continuously replacing the products. It doesn't matter if your, your phone lasts four years or 40 years. You don't want a four-year-old phone because it's not the latest product, right? So you've got a continuous replacement of the product. And if you look at the kind of throwaway lifetimes, you can see that all these economies are throwing things away until you get to Italy, which is on the average. And you've got at the other end, people like in India, keeping phones until 15 years. When this study was made, the, the, the lifetime was already dropping because of the marketing of you don't want to have an old phone, you've got to get rid of your phone, you've got to have the latest phone. Of course, it's all smartphones now. This is even before smartphones. It doesn't really matter. It'll be extra smartphones in the next year or whatever. So what we've got is a problem for a way fashion conscious society. It doesn't matter how durable your products are if you throw them away. So the throwaway fashion-conscious society driven by growth. And you've got to have that because new products mean growth in the economy. And growth is the core. Conspicuous consumption. People consume things because they want to see, be seen to consuming them. They have social groups. The marketing people are way advanced in terms of their psychology, way beyond the economists and their naive understanding from 1950s behavioural theory, which is getting Nobel Prizes. These guys are marketing to you and getting people to actually buy because they want to be in a social group. Look at the advertising boards. It's all about which group do you belong to. I want to be in this group. I better have that t-shirt. I better have that pair of shoes. I better have that hat. I better have that phone. I better have that computer. Because otherwise this group won't accept me. So it's self-identity is being marketed. So this is the real problem. But if we go to the biophysical reality and link up what's going on with the biophysical aspects, we should think be concerned about the laws of physics. So I guess most people here haven't studied the laws of physics either. No? So macroeconomists, nobody's studied physics at all. Great. Okay, so if we go to the physics, you look at thermodynamics and mass theory. So conservation, the first law of thermodynamics is about conservation of energy. But conservation of energy, energy like mass, is something that cannot be created or destroyed. It means that the mass and energy that exists in the universe or on planet Earth is the same no matter what we do, it's going to be there, right? So what does this mean? It means that economic growth, which is pushing this stuff through an economic system, transforming it, is going to create as much energy at the end of the day and the mass and materials as it puts in at the beginning. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not consumed, as the economist models say. It is an input and an output, and it's going to be there in equal mass and equal energy. That means that this stuff is being transformed and put through the economy and it's going to come out as waste. The faster and bigger your economy, the more waste you're going to have. It's very straightforward from the first law of thermodynamics. So you increase the inputs of material energy into the economy, you increase the waste loads into the environment. What this means is that when you talk about pollution, for example, pollution is not a one-off problem. Pollution is all-pervasive, right? Pollution is something that is fundamental to the growth economy. It's pushing this stuff through and it's got to go back into the environment. The other side of this is second law of thermodynamics is entropy. So we've got the same amount of energy before and after, but what's happened is that the energy is being transformed, it's being changed. So what we have is that we are actually very dependent upon low entropy, organised concentrated forms of minerals. And what we do when we actually see things like burn a lump of coal is we dissipate it. So you've got dissipation of both materials and energy going on. And entropy, the entropy law is about the change in the quality of available energy. And what it means is that uh, we are using up energy irreversibly. It's not a reversible process. 
energy will go from these concentrated forms and be dissipated. And that's how we create order in our society. We create order in both economic and social systems through using low entropy resources. So, order in our system relies upon the exploitation of low entropy resources. But when we use these resources, we dissipate them. So they're becoming not usable for us. They will not do useful work for humans after it's been, you've burnt the lump of coal, it's gone. The energy is dissipated. The energy still exists, it's now in a different form. And how do we create our, our modern economy, our progressive society? We depend upon three main sources of low entropy. So we've got the terrestrial stocks of concentrated minerals, solar flow of radiant energy, gravitational force of the moon, planets and the sun. Okay? These are our potential major low entropy sources. There's a few minor ones that are not there, but these are the major ones. And this terrestrial stocks of concentrated minerals, that is how we created the modern economy. That is the modern economy. What does that mean? It means if we take the United Kingdom, the first industrialized nation, you can see that this, this, uh, this pattern of a switch from an agro-biomass economy, a wood, wood, an agricultural economy. Britain actually logged uh, quite early on, so they were using coal for heating, unusual for, for economies. So you've got some coal use, but what you see with the Industrial Revolution is a massive increase in the exploitation of coal, low entropy fossil fuel resource. What you see after the Second World War is you see petroleum coming online, then later you see natural gas, and so you see that the, the economy is built on fossil fuels. This is the modern economy. It's a fossil fuel economy. That's the energy source. It's a fossil fuel economy. If you take other economies, other European economies, you'll see that they come into exactly the same pattern, but after the Second World War, most of them. Before the Second World War, a lot of the economies were still basically agri agricultural and biomass and wood. So this is a major change then in terms of the Industrial Revolution. What happens with the Industrial Revolution? A switch, industrialization, growth of the economy based on fossil fuel energy. So you live in a fossil fuel economy. That's what you are dealing with. So all your macroeconomics is based around the existence of fossil fuels and low entropy resources, which you do not take account of at all in your economics. So it's hardly surprising that we get a diagram like this, right? A direct link from the physical laws. So when you have GDP, GDP is just a measure of throughput going through the economy, the material flow round, the material energy flows, and of course carbon dioxide just goes up, right? You burn fossil fuels, you get carbon dioxide. It's hardly a miracle that we have climate change because it's a straightforward relationship between what we're doing. We're burning fossil fuels to maintain the economy. You want a growth economy. You want to go faster and faster. You're going to burn more fossil fuels. You're going to end up with more carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere. It's very straightforward. How anybody can question this is more uh, of, a, of a question than how they can uh, not, you know, not understand this. I mean, it's just amazing that anybody could question this. Basically, because people don't have any understanding of basic physics, the basic physical laws. So... What about the social crisis, understanding the social crisis and the ecological crisis? How does this link up? If we continue on, take that climate change example and take it a little bit further. We take the climate change issue. So we have an environmental crisis, we're told, because climate is going to change, the temperature is going to increase due to our carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere. We're going to end up with not just temperature increases, but climatic changes and redistribution of climatic patterns, rainfalls and so on. And this is going to have a major impact across a whole range of systems, ecosystems and so on. What we're told we should be doing about this, scientists, natural scientists say that we need to reduce 80% emissions on 1990 levels, for example. A, an article some years ago that was published in Nature to stabilise atmospheric concentrations and stand a chance of avoiding temperature rises above 2 degrees C. So... Questions we could ask. This science seems to be totally disconnected from social reality. The scientists are telling us that this is what is required, but what does this imply about social systems? What does this imply about society? What are the implications of this? It's not connected up. What are the social, political and economic implications if we take this seriously? What is meant by standard chance? 
What does that mean, stand a chance? And who gets the remaining 20%? But also we could raise questions, why 2 degrees C? What's so good about 2 degrees C? It's a politically set target. It has very little to do with any understanding from the science. The Paris Agreement. Right, we're in France, Paris Agreement. Article 2 claims that we can hold the temperature increases to well below 2 degrees C, but we should not just do that, we should pursue efforts to limit this to 1.5 to reduce the risk and impacts from climate change. So risk reduction. So we're not on 2 degrees C now, now we're going to go to 1.5. Well, the, the scientists were telling us we had to reduce our fossil fuel em emissions by 80%. Okay? So that means getting rid of 80% of your fossil fuels unless you've got some miracle up your sleeve. No plans to achieve 1.5. So the Paris Agreement was signed by 194 nations with absolutely no plans of how they're going to achieve 1.5. Right? The IPCC, the Advisory Scientific International Body that is meant to inform the Conference of the Parties for the Paris Agreement, didn't even include 1.5 in their scientific report, even though they are supposed to be a neutral scientific body re reviewing the literature. They ignored all the literature on anything less than 2 degrees, because 2 degrees was a politically set target. So, after the Paris Agreement, they had to go back to the drawing board and write another report on the 1.5. But what are the nations doing? The nations, meanwhile, have got gone independent, there's no multilateralism now, broken by the United States due to wars and various other things and it's anti-terrorism. It's now gone unilateral and the other nations of the world have gone unilateral with them. So you have independent targets now, not united targets. Independent nationally determined contributions or intended nationally de determined contributions, only intentions at the Paris Agreement. Even The Economist, one of the most conservative liberal magazines on economics you can find, says that these intentions are more in line with a total warming of 3 degrees C. Okay? So calculating from these various intentions to act, we're way above the targets that the Paris Agreement is supposed to be achieving. So let's look at some of the uncertainty around this. When we look at the kind of things that we need to be doing, you look at the carbon budgets, what's available for us to actually use? You look at the carbon budgets and what needs to be done, then you look at the uncertainty. This is an ongoing scientific issue. So a scientific article from 2014, taking the implicit standard chance, which is behind the Paris Agreement, is a 50-50 chance. 50-50 chance of avoiding 2 degrees C. If I said to you, get on this aeroplane, it's got a 50-50 chance of landing when you get to the other side, would you get on it? But that's what we're doing with the planet. A 50-50 chance of avoiding 2 degrees C. Okay, so this is the intention of Paris. Hidden behind it, you never see it, but that's the intention. So what's the budget that's left? If you look at these kinds of reports, you'll see these guys say that it's like 1,400 gigatons of CO2. So this is an old report. You update the report and you basically go through the figures and you can get a different number out of it. But if you go to the IPCC report, which is not a single paper, but the IPCC is actually going across the entire literature, you get a much lower figure for the available budget. So if you take the IPCC's available budget, the consensus scientific opinion, you've actually got almost 400 gigatons less. Right? So there's a much smaller budget. You update this figure for the last seven years, you get down to 930 gigatons. And this is without taking into account a whole range of emissions that are coming from a different sources, like land use change, which is a major source. So the budget that is available, if we take that original paper, the nice thing about that paper is that it kind of sets up this uh, in, a, in a nice graphic. If you look at what we need to do to avoid the two degrees, to stay under the two degrees, what they've done is they say, this is what we've already burnt, the purple stuff, okay? So that's already gone, that's in the upper atmosphere. Then we've got what's committed, the orange. What, why is it committed? Because we've built roads, aeroplanes, transportation systems, heating systems, power stations, we're committed to a whole bunch of burning fossil fuels. So that's the next bit. The orange bit is what's committed. And then you get into this area where you have remaining quotas. So depending on your target, there's a different quota. How strict do you want to be? 
Do you want a 50-50 chance or do you want a 100% chance and you've got less to burn? Do you want to go for 2 degrees or 3 degrees? So, what we have is the 2 degree target is here according to this paper. But if you, un if you actually go to the IPCC report, then you have a smaller budget. What that means is that for the two degrees, we almost have no room manu for manoeuvre at all on the IPCC. 50% chance of avoiding a disaster. Okay? And there's no budget left. But what's going on? There's no remaining quota. What we've got, actually, is that we've got people exploiting for more and more resources. What this top diagram shows you is the known reserves, proven reserves, plus unconventional fossil fuels. What are unconventional fossil fuels? Oil shales, tar sands, all the things, the fracking that's going on, these miracle new oil reserves that the United States is pushing all the time and saying, look, we can increase our oil production. Yes, you can increase your oil production and push the planet so far off the scale that we don't even know what the temperature is going to be. And this is the problem, right? Unusable reserves on the two degree target. And Paris is talking about a 1.5, and this is only a 50-50 chance. These reserves are unusable. Yet fossil fuel companies are going into the Arctic for exploration. They're exploring for more and more of these non-conventional fossil fuels all the time. Countries independently acting to burn more and more fossil fuels in their own interest. Economists supporting this. Growth is going well in our country. Great. An economist with no realisation of any biophysical reality or any understanding of what is really going on. So this is a serious situation, right? So if the Paris Agreement had really been an effective agreement, what would have happened to the stock market? If the Paris Agreement was really effective, all of the assets of every single oil and fossil fuel company would have been dropping through the floor. Clearly, the Paris Agreement is not a serious agreement. There was no impact on the stock market at all. Their share price is dependent upon these reserves. If they cannot burn these reserves without destroying the planet, they have no value. So, from prevention to risk management, what we have in the original uh, UN uh, Treaty on Climate Change, the UN uh, Convention, is the idea of stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climatic system. The Paris Agreement is now saying that 1.5 is the dangerous level. Right? And what is the world governments doing about this? Well, what we find is the United Nations, the UNFCCC's Director for Strategy, saying the following sorts of things. The treaty, signed in Rio in 1992, the UNFCCC, is a planetary risk management treaty. Its objective is not to prevent climate change, which is clearly not feasible. So basically, what he's saying is we're doing risk management. He, uh, I believe, is in total violation of the spirit of the treaty, if not the actual word with lawyers fighting over it. The treaty says prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference. He says it's not to prevent climate change. So we're into a risk management game. 50-50 chance, almost gone. Going for three degrees C. Nobody doing very much about it. And then Paris Agreement... What's the Paris Agreement doing? Written into the Paris Agreement is significantly reduce the risks and impacts. They've got the risk management rhetoric into the Paris Agreement. Who's taking the risks? And who gets to emit the greenhouse gases that are left? So if we have a budget and we have a fixed budget, who's going to get it? So there's three basic ways in which you can think about this in terms of the political arguments over who gets what budget. You can look at absolute emissions, who's responsible for that, who, per capita emissions and historical emissions. So if we start off, you get the arguments the United States might use, which is, look at China. China's got massive absolute emissions because they've industrialised very recently. They've gone down that exact same path that I showed you earlier of the industrial economy, moving from an agricultural economy into an industrial economy heavily based on fossil fuels. So the United States makes claims that it's reducing. Of course, it's offshoring. It's buying stuff from China as well. 
which doesn't get taken into account. And therefore, uh, you get this kind of a picture. So they would argue, well, China is responsible, and therefore we can't do anything in the United States until China comes on board. So this is the kind of thing. China and India then painted as being the, the bad people. But wait a second. China and India have massive populations. China has the largest population in the world, one billion people. So we should really, the Chinese would certainly say, be looking at per capita emissions, right? So if we go to per capita emissions, and we say, who has the rights to actually have emissions? You can see per capita, the oil states, Qatar at the top, the oil states, the oil production states, the very richest nations extracting the, the biggest surplus under capitalism, these are the guys who are way above in terms of their emissions per capita. So you've got massive emissions per capita and Australia coming in on number nine. But you could say, well, okay, per capita emissions is one thing, but that's not really the whole story either. Because if we actually take the absolute people, because the climate doesn't care about per capita emissions, the climate cares about the absolute emissions, and then we can look at the absolute emissions per capita. Then you'll see the United States comes out as the worst nation in the world, because basically they have massive absolute emissions, and they also emit more than anybody else per capita. Right? So they're basically inequitable society, basically responsible for a massive amount of emissions. Clearly, for them to control their emissions would mean shutting down their economy tomorrow. If they were going to get rid of 80% of their emissions, how would they do that? Stop production of fossil fuels. And the 80% is not even the target. It's even higher than that if you want to go to 1.5. And if you want to go above 50-50, it's even higher. So you've got this real problem, right? Fossil fuels tied in. But then you could say, OK, that's one thing, but actually, it's not just the United States, it's all those nations that industrialized and burnt all those fossil fuels in the past. Go to historical emissions, and you can see countries in Asia and Africa would argue that, look, you guys created your economies on the basis of burning all those fuels. North America and Europe industrialized early, and they burnt all these fossil fuels, and now the gases in the upper atmosphere that are actually forcing the climate. So this is why we say the social and the political cannot be divorced from the biophysical. And why the economic, the social and the ecological have to come together. But carbon control is actually not the whole issue. It's not even a small part of the issue. It's a major problem for sure. But there's a whole bunch of other issues. The environmental crisis is more than climate change. Climate change is even being used by corporations to, as a blind against other environmental problems. Focus everybody on climate change, get the governments to give you trillions so you can switch your energy investments and claim that we can't do this without government intervention because you're changing the rules on us. But wait a second, climate change? What about all the other problems? Soil erosion, deforestation, water salinization, insecticides and pesticides, nuclear fallout radiation, particulates in the air, tropospheric ozone pollution, stratospheric ozone pollution, acidic deposition, toxic chemical waste, heavy metals, asbestos, nuclear waste, biodiversity loss, acidification of the oceans, hormone discharge into water, microplastics, and so on. As I said at the very beginning, the point is that this is part of the economic structure. All the materials and energy are going through the system. There is a whole range of environmental problems created by this economy and the economic structure. The economies are not isolated systems. Economies are open systems. And this is the reality of an economy. The economic system requires physical inputs of materials and energy on a massive scale. And the more you grow that economy, the more materials and energy you're going to have going through it. But it's not just the scale of the economy, it's also the type of things that we've got going through the economy. We're changing all the time. High technology, green technologies. What are these high technologies and green technologies? More artificial things coming in from the environment. So smart, green, innovative technologies based around batteries, acids, metals, heavy metals, a whole range of, of, of metals that are actually relatively rare and so on. And this waste going back into the environment, all this e-waste that we have now. So economics and physical reality come together, and if you look at the economics, how do economists describe this? Mainstream economics describes all the environmental crises as an externality, something external to the system, right? Even back in 1970, mainstream economists 
environmental economists had recognised that this was not an aberration on a perfectly functioning economic system, but in actual fact that this was a normal, indeed inevitable part of the economic system. Right? So these pollution problems are normal. But if we go back into the history of thought, when we get to people like Cap, you can see that describing this as external to the system, when it's actually an integral part of the system, it's only one aspect of it, but actually corporations and successful entrepreneurs are cost shifting. And the successful entrepreneur and the successful corporation shifts costs onto others. That's part of the process. You don't want to pay for your pollution, you get someone else to pay for it. You dump it in the river, you dump it in the soil, you dump it in the air, and you don't pay for it. You do your production in a third world country where there's no health and safety laws, there's no environmental regulation, you offshore, you let people die, you exploit. That's success. That's being a successful corporation, shifting your costs onto other. The successful entrepreneur in the modern environment. So successful cost shifting exercises, not externalities that require some government to come along and intervene to make them internal. So it's a fundamental different view of the economy. And there is no free market economy. The whole concept of this free market economy with its equi equilibrating prices that are organised through competition is a total fallacy. Because if you take what I've told you, these are pervasive material and energy flows into the environment, that means every single product produced has an environmental impact. Every single product would have to have its price changed through an internalisation of externalities in the neoclassical model, which means that every single price is wrong. And who is going to calculate the new prices? Economists. Central planners. The economist becomes the central planner. And if you don't calculate the prices, you have a system that implicitly is planned not to calculate the prices, and therefore it's a planned economy anyway. So you live in a planned economy. It's planned to be a disaster, socially and ecologically, and that's where it's going. So, greenwashing. Unsustainable economies. What we're told then by the mainstream is that a green economy can price and market non-marketed goods, and that's what should be going on. That we have to internalise externalities, and this will create a new market, we'll correct the market failures, and we can have a green and growing economy. And there's lots of reports from the UN, OECD, various others who are pushing this approach. Greenhouse gas emissions reduction is a new opportunity, we're told, a new opportunity to increase growth rates, right? Totally unhinged from biophysical reality, of course. Trading on global carbon markets, the infamous Stern report, which is saying this is an opportunity to make money. Right? This is basic economics 101, these guys have got wrong. Okay? If you have disasters and you have to pay to clean up a disaster, this is not an addition to wealth and well-being. The more disasters we have, our society is not better off. The more police and military, the more clean-up of pollution we have does not increase the well-being of our society. So intermediate goods and defensive expenditures, as they were called in the 70s, do not improve our society. So these guys, like Stern, famous economists, award-winning economists, given you know, knighthoods in Britain and lordships and so on, basically fail on Economics 101. They go on, though, better growth, better climate. A major push by Davos elite to actually get into the Paris Agreement, the idea that the growth economy is what we need and we should push the growth economy and the growth economy will actually solve the climate crisis. The opportunity to build lasting economic growth at the same time as reducing the immense climatic change risk. So they got the risk management in there, they managed to get that into the Paris Agreement. They've got the idea that you can maintain the growth economy and that the growth economy is kind of miraculously going to solve the problem. Competitive markets in which prices properly reflect the full costs of production. And how the hell would the prices do that? <coughs> Lord Stern's pissing contest. You may not have come across this in your macroeconomics. Lord Stern, interviewed by The Guardian, 
says that you should not criticise economic growth. Don't even dare to do it. He's quoted it. To those who want to knock out growth from objectives, I find they're close to reprehensible. I think to say that we should just switch off growth is to miss a big aspect of what matters about poverty. And so it worries me. It's also politically very naive. If you turn it into a pissing contest between growth on the one hand and climate environment on the other and say you've got to choose, you're setting yourself up for failure. So Lord Stern would have us deny biophysical reality because otherwise we're going to have a pissing contest. So we must have growth. And he says we must have growth to address poverty and improve human well-being. And to pro opposing growth is reprehensible, naive and doomed to failure. This is an old story. The Brundtland Report, famously quoted all the time, the Brundtland Report supposedly bringing together development and the environment. Brundtland, sustainable development seeks to meet the needs and aspirations of the present without compromising the ability to meet those of the future. This is the famous, often quoted sentence. What needs and aspirations might be is, of course, open. But in the Brundtland Report, it's not open. It's very clear what they mean. They mean growth. They mean the growth economy, they mean material and energy throughput, and that you've got to have more material and energy throughput in order to make people better off. Five to tenfold increase in economic growth is recommended in the Brundtland Report. Five to tenfold. Think about that in material and energy terms. How the hell are you going to do anything about climate change with a five to tenfold increase in the economy? Problems of poverty and development cannot be solved unless we have a new era of growth. So poverty is now linked into the economic growth machine. But it's not just the developing countries that need to grow. No, the developed economies need to grow as well because they've got to be part of the solution as well, right? Industrial countries, 3 to 4% minimum, the international financial institutions believe is required. The new UN growth imperative is in embedded in the sustainable development goals, was also cited at the very beginning of the Paris Agreement, at least 7% gross domestic product per annum in the least developed countries. So 7%, right? Massive growth and throughput. And how are they going to square this with the environment? Endeavour to decouple the economic growth from the environmental degradation. Endeavour. Not actually do it, just endeavour to do it. Tim Jackson, closer to home. So it's not just these mainstream economists like Stern. Tim Jackson has a, uh, a report which has been heavily cited and circulated and so on, and he gets invited a lot to degrowth conferences. Tim Jackson's book, originally a report, Prosperity Without Growth, Economics for a Finite Planet. Prosperity Without Growth, that is the title. It should be called Prosperity After Growth. Because actually, in Tim Jackson's book, he does not describe how to get prosperity without growth, he actually recommends very strongly a key motivation for rethinking prosperity in advanced economies is to make room for much needed growth in poorer nations. You need growth. That's the only conceptualization they have of improving human well-being. And more than that, there is no case to abandon growth universally. In these poorer countries, that growth really does make a difference. So it's just the mainstream story again. We need growth. Growth is going to actually solve the poverty problem. So, who are the poor? If we're really concerned about poverty, how do we measure the poor? 1.7 billion people, 23% of the world's nations, in multiple dimensions of poverty. So you've got to actually address at least 23% of the world with your new growth. And in actual fact, if you go to like the US uh, kind of income per year or the World Bank nut figures, they always use, like to do it in dollar values. What you'll find is that you can look at who is poor and you'll find that if you take the population of the US, $10, $10 a day or less, you get 365. That means that everybody who 80% of the world's population is below the poverty line according to the US. Poverty line in the US is $11,000. Basically what this means is that 80 to 90% of the world's population is, should be counted as poor, which means that growth should be for 80 to 90% of the world's population. If you want to bring the world up to the basic poverty standard in the United States, you're addressing 80 to 90 percent of the world. So this is not a small thing. This is growth for the entire world. So what's the real issue? The real issue is that we've had lots of growth. 
and what we've got is massive inequity and inequity is increasing. Right? So you've got inequity in society. And this is what capitalism is doing. It redistributes the income to the elite. Two myths then in economics. Inequality is addressed by economic growth, trickle-down theory. And the idea that once basic needs are met, more economic growth will continue to increase happiness. We have to keep increasing growth, regardless of how much we've had in the past and how we've, where we've got to. Right? So you don't care about hedonic pleasures and positional goods. You don't pay any attention to that. So how would macroeconomists or economists go about describing this? We could set up a nice model, right? We could go through the macroeconomic model and do all this, the maths to start calculating how trickle-down would work and how this would work and that would work and so on and so forth. Or, rather than doing all this mathematical modelling, <laughs> we could just cut to the chase and just have a couple of simple pictures, right? Trickle-down theory is very straightforward. The North is pissing on the South and exploiting them. And people are not made happy by having more and more stuff. Right? So these are basically self-evident. But what we get instead, we get the European 2020 strategy. It's almost 2020, right? What's the European 2020 strategy? A smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. Well, apparently we haven't achieved that. We're not smart, sustainable or inclusive. This whole strategy is embedded in a competitive economy. The whole idea of the 2020 strategy is about competition. Sustainability hardly gets mentioned. Greening is mentioned like 14 times. There's 38 references in this document to competition. Competing globally, competing against other nations, competing against China. North America must compete with China. Northern Europe competing against Southern Europe, Germany competing against the French, the French competing against the Italians, the Spanish getting dropped out, the, the Greeks dropping out, and so on and so forth. We must increase our competitive versus our trading partners as well. It's all about competition and growth and innovation. Right? Innovation is heavily linked into this. So what we get is pick the winner, right? Who's going to win in this competition? And of course there's going to be losers. So if there's going to be winners in this game, there's going to be losers, that's for sure. And that's the one thing you can be sure of. There will be winners, there will be losers if you go down this route. And this is the route we're going down right now. Real competition is about innovation technologies and securing resources and energy. We've already emphasised the need for material and energy. And how do you do this? Well, you do it with the military. So the military is an integral part of the modern economy. Something else which is a large gap in your macroeconomic models and your approach to understanding the economic system and its reality. The military is not some sideshow. It's not some small thing. You look at the size of the military in the United States. You look at the amount, number of people who are employed in the military. This is a major expenditure. And the military expenditure is going into technology. And the technology is then shifted and it comes back into society. And this changes the way society is run. Your mobile phones, satellites, all these kinds of things. The modern competitive economy is built around the military. The military is an essential part of it, and it always has been. So the development is growth model. What do we get? Development is growth. is massive fossil fuel combustion, resource extraction, pollution. Land grabbing, both domestic and foreign. Militarization and imperialization. Forced urban migration, creating of urban underclass. So you see this in China, you saw it in Britain in the 1800s. You put people off the land, you put them into the cities, and you create an you know, urban underclass that can therefore serve industry. Denigration of traditional lifestyles and culture. Oh, you don't want to live in a sustainable lifestyle, you don't want to live on farms, you don't want to live with agriculture, that's backward looking. You've got to have that deconstructed, you've got to destroy rural communities, you've got to destroy a sense of traditional values. Urban centres are good, burning fossil fuels are good, flying is good, having a car is good, having a mobile phone is good, etc. Establishing a minority rich elite and a new middle class, as China has done. China is a big success, right? And India is doing the same thing. So this is actually another graphic that summarises the military industrial economy. Fat cats at the top, as we can see in America. Securitization of society through domestic police and militarised police forces, an anaesthetised population who vote now and again and don't really care, and 
the external military maintaining the resource supplies from third world countries that are being exploited. And you can see the biggest GDPs, the biggest military expenditures. So, last section. Thought and action, a different social ecological economy. The three research agendas, I think, for a new economics, because we need to get a new economics and a new economy. First of all is what is the present? What do we have as, as our present economy? What is the structure of the existing political economy? As I've tried to point out to you, our economics is totally inadequate, whether it is heterodox or mainstream. It does not take account of biophysical reality and it does not connect to the military industrial complex or the way the economy is actually operating. We need a, a, a whole bunch of research around transformation. If we're going to change the economy, if we're going to get to 1.5, let alone 2 degrees, we, we've got to actually look at a social ecological transformation. A fundamentally different economy, one that does not use fossil fuels. There has never been an industrial economy that was not built on fossil fuels. It does not exist, it has never existed, and nobody knows how to create it. It's a major transformation, and nobody is doing research on this all they're doing is trying to create a green economy, the same economy again, which is actually heavily dependent on the use of fossil fuels itself. The future, what is the future? What would we like to see? What is our, actually our utopian vision? We need a utopian vision. We need to think about utopias, the future where we're heading to, not just going off randomly to the future. I don't have time to go through this in detail. You can look at the slides later. There's a whole research agenda of issues that are not being addressed and not funded by economic institutions or governments that need to be addressed, all the way from governments, the role of corporations in society, their anti-democratic nature, the role of innovation and technology, what it does to society, its social implications, the role of financing, trade, our long supply chains, exploitation of other, market, other people, the role of pricing and markets, when should they, m pricing and markets be stopped, and when, should it, when is it limited, a whole range of stuff. How do we re reproduce the economy? Patriarchy in society, the dominance by white older men of every single strong position in society, these kinds of things. Non-market sectors, how they're not taken into account, how they're denigrated, power relationships, our democracy, our legal system. Problems about agency versus structure, so the whole economy, the economic picture is built around individualism, methodological individualism. There's no discussion of structure, the structure of the economy. Biophysical relationships, nature and non-humans. And our values, what are our values in our society? The social and ecological values. The social and ecological transformation, then we need to have realise that the system is dynamic, systems are open, they're open systems, they're changing over time. Transformation is inevitable. You will get old and you will all die. This is inevitable. Our economies will change. Yes, you'll be dead in some decades, along with everybody else. This is transformation, this is change. You cannot stop this. Therefore, there is no equilibrium. If you think about the economy, the economic system, there is no such thing as an equilibrium. There is only continuous change. Prices are not in equilibrium. They're continuously changing. Anybody who does a little bit of econometrics knows this. There is no steady state economy. There is no steady state because there is no equilibrium. Things are always changing. This means that a research agenda looks, needs to look at the mechanisms and the triggers about alternative futures. What are we creating? What do we do? You can see just from the climate change discussion that we're locked in through our infrastructure into a whole bunch of things that we don't really want because we've built ourselves into a block. So what are the blocks? What's allowed change? No one is really looking into this. Institutions and power. What institutions do we require? If we have institutions that are basically lying to us about the situation of the world, that are basically telling us that everything is going to be okay, that there's some magic engineering solution going to come along in a few years' time. These are bad institutions. They are bad scientifically, they're bad politically, and those institutions should be criticised by us, scientists, on scientific and rational grounds, because they are misleading. So institutions need to be changed, and that means we need different institutions in society, and we can conduct a whole bunch of concrete case studies to do our research in a different way for social ecological transformation. And what about utopia? Well, actually, utopia is used as a derogatory term quite a lot, right? There's nothing more utopian than a capitalist economy. There's nothing more utopian than the growth economy, than the economy we live in today. The idea that everybody can have the same level of income is, is in the United States today. That everybody can have the same material and energy throughput. It is not possible. Right? This is a utopian vision.
capitalism, neoliberalism, welfare economy, yes, the welfare economy as well, sustainable development, bioeconomy, green economy, all of these are built around capital accumulation. They are traditional growth economies and they're all utopias. There are then, all of these are a set of utopian economies never described as that, requiring high technology and individualism to underpin them. And what we should be doing is we should be having research and should be discussing a whole set of other utopias, different ways to live. There isn't the one economy, as those textbooks said at the very beginning of the talk. There isn't one way to think as an economist. That is the utopian trap up here. What we have is a whole bunch of alternatives. And I might just mention at this point, people like, who are experimenting in the ZAD are being destroyed by the French state because they're doing something alternative. What is a bunch of hippies on a small piece of farm? Why is this such a threat to the French nation state? that they have to send in thousands of military troops to destroy their little wooden huts. Is this a big threat to the industrial state of France? Well, apparently it is, because it's a different utopian vision than the one that they want to push forward. And if a lot of people start looking at different utopian visions, maybe they'll change the economic system. So, conclusions. Growth is based on low entropy resource exploitation. This is very straightforward. Modern industrial society requires low entropy. This is a fundamental that goes back to the physics. Externalities are not external. They're part of the system. Material and energy use creates pollution. It disrupts ecosystems functions. It impacts on human health. It impacts on non-human animals and so on. It's part of the system. Technology Technology is not neutral. Technology introduces a whole range of new substances into the environment. It is by definition the high technology is actually based around lots of artificial substances of which we don't know the consequences. Therefore we have, in Keynesian sense, true uncertainty about them. Unpredictable social and environmental consequences. As everybody who has lived before the mobile phone will know, it has fundamentally changed the way humans interact and the way that they actually even think of themselves and even think. Green growth is traditional economic growth. It's not some new miracle. It's part of the same old system, and it's part of the same capitalist system and the same capital accumulating system, and it's also built around the same problems. The social, ecological, and economic problems are not being addressed. Faith remains in a utopian vision, but the utopian vision is the growth vision, and we need an altern alternative ut utopian vision. We've got gross social in inequity and in instability coming along, then these problems are not being addressed by the growth economy and you continuously must rely in the growth economy on exploitation. Look at the supply chains, look at the offshoring, look at where the resources come from, look at the military and what the military is doing today. Read the newspapers and look between the lines and you'll see this is what goes on. Real competition is backed by military might. That's why you see the strongest nations have strongest military and are supported by the strongest militaries. Social economics then, what's this about? A call for a radically different economics and society, deconstructing an economic economy based on growth and consumerism and capital accumulation, prioritizing social inequity, poverty and injustice, redistributing the balance of power within democracy, rejuvenating democratic institutions and processes, creating institutions for articulation of environmental values in their broadest sense, new institutions, not cost-benefit, not monetary valuation, revitalizing nature and human-nature relationships, and rather than regarding nature as just a resource to be exploited. So what we need is to changing the existing political economy to a better, more socially just, environmentally ethical, and economically equitable system. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we will start with some questions that we prepared and then we'll open for, for questions. But before that, I want to open the window. <laughs> yeah, fine. Maybe that can help to reduce some degree in the, in the room. <laughs> sure. Super can probably open the door as well. Super okay. Um, so, I have two questions about strategies. Um, <laughs> uh, well, 
So the first one would be uh, about the differentiation between advocacy and academics. Uh, often they are really strongly uh, dissociated. Um, and through your work, you, you show some sort of a, another vision now uh, they could be put together. I was wondering uh, mm -hmm. if you can expand on, on that vision um, and mm -hmm. if it's um, needed for radical economic transfer, ecological transformation and how it's inc inscribed in this. Can I answer that first? Yes. Right. So <coughs> basically what you say is that the traditional economic mo uh, scientific <coughs> approach, the philosophy of science, has gone through in modernity the idea of objectification. So the objectification is that the truth just pops out at you. And therefore, the, to get to the truth, you have to remove all values. This goes back to Hume and uh, a very much a dichotomy between facts and values. It's fundamentally flawed. Fundamentally flawed is a philosophy of science. And you can see this. No economist can do economic work, serious economic work, without criticizing institutions and society. Just say you do something simple like doing unemployment, analysis of unemployment. So say that you think that people are unemployed because they are lazy and that they don't want to work. So you do a piece of work on this and you find out actually people are unemployed because of a whole bunch of other reasons, not because they're lazy and they don't want to work. What you've just done with that piece of objective research is you've just criticised some major political parties like Thatcher's Britain and her conservative policies which were built around denigrating people and saying that the unemployed were lazy. And there's plenty of right-wing parties around today who say the same thing. So if you do this neutral piece of unemployment research, you immediately attack institutions. And it's the same across the board. It's very self-evident in the social sciences that social science research cannot be done without being critical. And if you then do your piece of research and bury it in a journal and then don't follow it up, then what are you doing? Why did you do the research in the first place? It's pointless, right? So there's a need for research to be, in philosophy of science, thought about as its emancipatory role. What is the role of scientific research? We're told that science is about improving society. So what are you doing with social science research? You're not doing social science research to leave it in a journal or a box or to file it away. You're doing social science research because you're going to have an impact on society. And therefore, it's bound to be value-laden. And there's nothing wrong with being value-laden in research. I mean, this is one of the most ridiculous things that goes around today. So you get people appointed to things like being in charge of committees on biodiversity who are financiers and bankers who know nothing about biodiversity. Why? because they know nothing about, about biodiversity, that's why they're there. And are these the people you want? I mean, would you say, I want to get on this aeroplane with its 50-50 chance of getting there, and I'm going to have a pilot that's not got no training in how to fly? It makes as much sense. So if you actually have people who have an interest in something, they're the people who should be doing the research. Right? So this idea of the denigration of people who have an interest and making them bias. So. So I think you have to rethink it. I think if you go down the philosophy of science route when you have a critical realist perspective, then you would find in critical realism that you actually get to a much better understanding of science, the way that science can, can be conducted and what it is to do scientific research. And in actual fact, what scientific research is doing in society. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, is the following. I mean, I'm, I'm not a specialist in these topics, but uh, I would think that one of the main reasons, if not the main, that uh, governments uh, say in order not to address all these problems you, you have just mentioned, is that they lack the, fun the, the necessary funds to, to, to uh, address all. But then I, I, I was thinking about, for example, these proposals of a, a green quantitative easing or even the, the, the possibility that the IMF has in, in terms of the, the special drawing rights in terms of, in order to effectively finance all these, uh, all these kind of problems. So my question is, why do, you, why do you think that they are not being used? It's like a pure ideological thing, or, or what's your opinion on, on Okay, this? so the lack of funding, I think, is one of the biggest lies that you have. What you have is, you look at how much is spent on the military, right? Trillions, trillions going into the military. And then we're told we have lack of funding. You look at what happened in 2008, financial crisis. 
suddenly trillions appear from nowhere and bail out all these corporations and banks and so on and so forth. Suddenly, miraculously, oh, we have financing. Trillions just appear all of a sudden. So what is it? It's not about lack of financing. It's about a lack of priorities. But people are not prioritizing. Governments do not care about this kind of stuff. And why should they? Why should they care? The Germans are doing very nicely. The Americans are doing very nicely by exploiting South America, Africa, Asian countries, and so on. Now China comes along and spoils the game for them. So now they have to compete. India comes along and spoils the game a bit more. So they have to compete a bit more. So we get closer to old-fashioned resource wars. And we have resource wars, right? We've had fights over oil. So put more money into the military. You don't get to address the fundamental problems. And why talk about financing? Is it about financing? We're talking about this changing the structure of the economy. It's not just about finance. It's about how people behave, how they live their lives. Part of it's about structure and infrastructure, right? But the structure we're talking about is institutions. It doesn't require money, necessarily, to change institutions. Institutions, you know, defined in classic institutionalism, are rules and regulations, norms of behaviour, and conventions. So we're talking about changing fundamental things in human society, not finance. So I think there's a misunderstanding in this kind of orthodox approach We've got to have money, it costs too much, we can't do that. This is a very orthodox way of looking at things. Uh, oh. I prefer to answer directly because I think they kind of get lost if you do three. So first of all, um, many thanks for this very interesting presentation and um, I think that uh, more and more heterodox economists are aware of the fact that the ecological issue has become central and uh, when we, we thought about Epoch 2.0, the ecological issue is central in the next uh, step of Epoch and hopefully in the very next step we'll be able to include uh, the University of Vienna uh, around this heterodox project. Um, but I have many, many questions. The first one is that maybe there is an elephant in the room here and the name of the elephant is George Skurogan because what you explained, I think, many of these things have been explained years ago by him and nobody has, t has paid attention to him. And, uh, but uh, I thought uh, your presentation was really interesting. Uh, discussing. If you've got a series of things, I can answer this one straight away, right? So, Georgesco Rogan is foundational in ecological economics. Yeah. Georgesco Ro Rogan wrote his major book in the 1970s. It has yeah. some flaws, and he never really addressed social issues. Sure. So, he never got to the social ecological side of things. Sure. I, I'm not saying you're saying the exact same thing. I'm saying we have this book in the 70s, and nobody paid attention, and, and we are still there in economic theory. Yeah. And, um, okay. Uh, coming to growth as a post Keynesian, uh, I've not, I've realized only recently that growth has become an obsession only in the 60s, uh, during the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, while when you read Keynes and Minsky and all these other authors, they, they care about employment. And uh, maybe we should get back to this mm. main concern. And in growth, I, I wouldn't dismiss everything. For example, my wage, they, they don't know how to assess civil servants. So my wage uh, goes into uh, the GDP and therefore is there, if they increase my wage, uh, it means that the GDP will increase. So in growth, there are also useful things, but I, I, I don't think it's the best indicator of the of the well-being of an economy. So, okay, so uh, if you go back to Keynes, you will find that in Keynes, the, in Keynes for our grandchildren, he is concerned about growth and he does actually talk about the growth economy. He does actually talk about the need for capital accumulation and therefore I think it is core to his basic understanding of what needs to be done, not just unemployment. And the pro one of the problems I have with the post-Keynesians is their definition of work and employment and their total fixation on unemployment and the difficulty of actually defining what is work, what is the meaning of jobs, what is the meaning of being in society, what is the meaning of existing in a society. So you're captured already in terms of this the economy model, chapter 2, figure 1. 
right? Short. Yeah. Short yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'll be short, right? Uh, to me, you know, when you're on the left, it's always a question of uh, dialogue, right? And so, you know, let's assume that you're a revolutionary and I'm a reformist, right? And what I wonder about is your blanket dismissal of everything in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, there, 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 is a, there, there is a transition process, right? Now, one way to have a transition process is to have the ecological crisis explode systemically, and then you have kind of a, a new species emerging with a new system, and that's pretty much the implication that you draw. Uh, the other one is a, a pro, you know, a, a generational transformational process that starts with a certain kind of regime changing uh, push. In that sense, the Paris Agreement could be that, because it sets a goal, it, it highlights and explicates a contradiction that eventually will have to be dealt with, right? So in your approach, in your discourse, in your work, it's, all, it's, it's, a, it's a valid critique, and then you call for utopia, and then you have utopian goals, and there's something missing, which is the transitional process that no, is not just driven by crisis. There's right? three elements. If you look at my slide, the current system, the transformation of society, which is the transition, and the utopian vision, and there are three. So it's not missing, it's actually there. Your evolutionary take, which is what you basically described uh, in, your, uh, in your approach, that we you know, either have this jump or we're going to have a generational kind of uh, transfers. I didn't uh, actually say that at all, and I wasn't I alluding. Question. Yeah, okay, but the, the question, the way you frame it, right, within this kind of evolutionary terminology, <coughs> I would say that the, the first point that you're making, it's not about a new species coming along if there's this crisis, I think that there will be a massive change in our society which is going to be very disruptive and it's ongoing right now. It's the borders being put up, it's the militarization of society, it's the fear, it's the grabbing of the resources, it's ongoing every day and it's been getting worse for the last 20 years. It's in your face now, it's not you know, something that we can talk about is going to happen in some distant future like we you know, like was talked about in the 1970s, it's now here, right? And this means division in society, <coughs> it means the increasing wars and problems, it means a lot of people dying, and it's going to be a nasty world. That's what we're facing if we don't do something more intelligent. So that's what I'm saying is we need to do something more intelligent. That's why I emphasize very strongly the need for social change. Do I throw out everything? No, what I do is I criticise what is going on for a lack of social and ecological reality. The Paris Agreement is not a realist agreement. It is pie in the sky and it is unhinged. It has no reality about it at all. Why is it so lauded by everybody <coughs> from the richest oil nations to the biggest oil corporations? Because it is irrelevant. So just a comment, um, I think you're surrounded by people who completely agree with every critique you bring up at re with regards to unsustainability of the current um, trajectory. At the same time, I would agree with um, Professor Goodman in, in so far as it does seem to be somewhat overgeneralizing uh, over to say that you know, all these economists who try to you know, put into a formal model ecological constraints, even um, neoclassical cap and trade sort of approaches um, are, are somehow not going to achieve or go, not going to be helpful at all. It just seems like when it's not helping. So you mentioned the philosophy of science. It takes a theory to beat a theory. And um, all the criticisms in the world are not going to change, you know, change the system itself. We need a new theory, right? So I just, I just kind of worry with this level of rhetoric that's it's not conducive to actually um, promoting the new theory that you're calling for, rightfully so, um, just because it's, it's laden with all this almost the fear that we all share and the, the, the sort of hope for change that we all share. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just like to sort of almost just actually defend those, those people who are trying to be creative and failing to get to the right theory because it's a really hard problem. Mm -hmm. um, I okay, guess that's, so, that's I mean, so, so this is a very standard uh, critique, which is you can't uh, criticise something unless you have something better to replace it with, right? This is a very standard thing, and it's fundamentally flawed as a scientific approach because 
you know, if, you, if I build a bridge and it's a really crappy bridge and I tell you to go walk across it and you say, well, you're not a bridge builder, you can't build a better bridge than I built, therefore you can't criticise my bridge. I mean, that's basically what you've got going on here. You've got theories which are unhinged from reality and highly problematic and it's not like we're not trying, and there's not just me, but a community of people to build alternative theories. It's that you're discriminated against, like the people in the ZAD who want to have an alternative society, that you're purposefully being suppressed, that you're having people stop the funding, stop the criticism, stopping the voice. There is no debate or discussion in society, so what you have is you have people being trained to reproduce the model, to reproduce the discourse in a very minor little you know, nuanced discussions around the fringes which aren't addressing the problem. Time is over. Sorry. You know, I don't have the miraculous new economy in my back pocket. Sorry I didn't bring it with me. But why aren't you working on it as well? Why aren't we all working on this, right? For example, the point is you, can, you, you, know, you get to the stage where you've set up the critique and that there's all these problems. Try to work on alternatives. You won't find any funding for alternatives. Right? So this is the real issue. What are the, what's going on with government? What's going on with research? What's going on with funding? What are the corporations doing? What does the media do? Where's the discussion and debate? <coughs> These are real issues, right? Just to say deep work, and that's it, without any sort of more model to say why deep work, you know? Okay, so I had uh, 45 minutes to talk. If you wanted me to give a talk on degrowth, I could have given a talk on degrowth. As I understood, you guys understand absolutely nothing about biophysical reality. You do. Okay, so I was told that you have no uh, link to environment and you don't know how the economy links to the biophysical reality. I asked if anybody had any physics, not one person put their hand up, right? So, so this was the talk I gave. If you want me to talk about degrowth, invite me back. I'll talk about it. So, first I will thank you for your presentation. Okay, it moves a step forward from the discourse that I'm used to hear from before, and this is a credit, but also there are shortcomings that we have to consider. Okay, so first if we, uh, I would add something about something that I really agree with you, is about that the current system is a fake system, about trying to change the situation of the environment, and it's mainly rely on the climate change. But there is also a large business behind this discourse, because you have a lot of companies, consultation companies, in the name of trying to transform from the old system to green economy, they are doing a large business exploiting the developing countries to do this process. The, the developing countries do not have the knowledge, do not have the funding, so the funding is an issue for them. It's not true that it's not an issue, it is an issue for them. Okay, and this led me to take another question. Who will take the responsibility for this change? Is it the developing countries who has, some of them has nothing to do with the current system? And what is the alternatives behind it? Because what you are doing is exactly, you are doing the right critiques, but what are the alternatives? how to destroy a whole system that has been built through more than 100 years. You are changing, like, because what you are saying, I need to destroy almost everything. Social aspects, consumption aspect, economic structure, how to do that. And would uh, the capitalist would allow, like, would allow this transformation to happen? In my opinion, <coughs> I don't think so. Okay, so 100 years is nothing. The system that has been destroyed by the intervention of the development is growth model, that is being destroyed on a daily basis by the development of growth model that has destroyed a 2,000 year old culture in China, right? A 100 year culture that needs to be changed, which is run by a minority of people. It's not the whole society. The larger society is living in subsistence agriculture. They are still living in subsistence agriculture on a global basis. People directly are related to this. If you look at somewhere like India, what's happening with this development as growth model? is you've got massive suicides amongst farmers who are having their land grabbed, who are being forced into cities. <coughs> this is not development as growth. I'm not destroying a system. I wish I could change this system. This system is destroying thousand-year-old cultures, not 100 years of capitalism. So I think this is the real issue. 
The financial issue, okay? The financial issue, what I was asked was, isn't this about financing? Isn't there a lack of financing? Isn't this why politicians don't support it? And my reply was, no, it's not. You're raising a different issue. You're saying, okay, if you want to address climate change, then developing countries need financing to do this. Need financing to do what, <coughs> right? They're not the emitters. So the whole point is that they're not the ones who have to control the greenhouse gases. The financing issue in climate change is built around adaptation. And that means that you're going to have climate change and someone's going to have to adapt to it. And that the, worst is, you know, the poorest people are the least able to adapt and they're going to get screwed. That's the issue. It's not about funding new green technologies so that third world countries can become industrialised. Because the new green technologies are going to be cornered by the Germans and the corporations and the richest nations, because they're the ones who are controlling the system. So, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. I, I just don't see it working at all like that. Destroying the system, we need to change the system, and we need to stop it destroying the existing system, I would say. <coughs> okay. Uh, we will eat part of the concluding address because I think it's re a really interesting debate. So at first, I think it's really great that you come with your radical point of view, and it's also my view, so it's, it's, it's great. And it's, I have part of the responsibility if all those students never heard within the program anything of what you've said. And I really hope we will be able to make it, but when Danny is talking about introducing sustainability issues, I, I'm pretty sure we're not talking about, about exactly the same thing, not at all what, what you are talking about. So my matter is a matter of strategy, not a matter of alternative, but a matter of strategy. I've been uh, an activist in an okay, ecological environmental associations, uh, more or less grassroots, uh, for more than 18 years. And let's say that I realize what you've said one or two years ago. Uh, meaning that even though I was inside, I mean, concerned by those issues, I just, re what you've just said is that we have a wall not there, we have a wall here, and we are, we are in a car going very fast. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you have three elements that are important. Many people lack, have, have, there is a lack of information about that. This is the first point. The second point is that, okay, many, Players are looking for, uh, at the short term, accumulation. So we are in this world currently, so let's try to benefit from this world currently and don't think about... And the other aspect is that you don't want to see the reality because if you are looking at the reality, I mean, what can you do? And, and the, the question is right. I mean, uh, if this is the reality, I believe so. I don't see how can we uh, escape this reality. And um, when you discuss with, even with people of very uh, important organization, not small, uh, but very important organization working on that issues, they said, we know that, okay, it's over, it's finished, we cannot do anything, we will go towards an authoritarian model because there will not be any escape of this. Yeah. We need to continue being activists because, I mean, we have to do so, but... Yeah. Okay, And on the other side, on another world, let's say the Silicon Valley, you have another storytelling, which is transhumanism, technology, etc., etc., which is much more appealing because you think that, okay. So my, my question is not uh, whether it's true. Or, in my view, it's completely true. But the strategy, the real relevant strategy is very, very complicated with respect to, t to this situation. And some of, of, our, uh, of my colleagues are, are just wondering, whether we have to think about the world after the collapse rather than trying to escape this collapse. Yeah. Okay, sorry for this optimistic uh, point of view. So this is actually part of the alternative research agenda, right? So I, uh, you know, unlike I, you were saying that I wasn't, we, we don't discuss alternatives, there is a whole community working on alternatives and there are people living alternative lifestyles. Now, a lot of people who are working on the alternative, and I also think this, is that when, if we don't succeed in diverting this and we end up with crisis, then what do we do in crisis? So if you take somewhere like Greece, what happens in Greece when the system collapses? People go back to <coughs> the rural areas, they go back to the villages, they go back to family, and they start to recreate the old traditional systems. And they have to recreate them because there's nothing to support them in this system, right? 
So what we can do that's more intelligent is then rather than leaving people anarchistically to their own resources, is to work out what an alternative economy would be like, how it could operate, when the crisis happens, what do we do? And if you can do that and you can also connect it with political party of some sort, then you have a chance to avert the totalitarian right-wing authoritarian regimes, hopefully. But if we don't actually get the economic stuff going, if we don't actually take the alternatives seriously, if we don't realise that they aren't worked out and they need to be worked out, then we will be in the totalitarian authoritarian world. <coughs> so, yes, also my question was uh, on, on reality more than theory. So, I come from Italy, more specifically, I come from uh, Basilicata, that is a small region in southern Italy that is mainly based on the neocolonial ex exploitation of local working class and local uh, r natural resources, mainly uh, fossil uh, fossils. And uh, well, I also have been a, a militant, not only a social activist, but really a militant in the battles in my region. And uh, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I will try to. <laughs> One moment, let me finish. Then I. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, since I, s li living in a capitalist society, also in a not so advanced capitalist society means paying wages and, uh, and profits. So, the idea of reducing 80% of emissions uh, in, uh, in the last, will, will imply a, a huge decrease of, uh, of employment in, the, my, in my region, that is a region already characterized by uh, yeah, uh, huge emigration rates, uh, huge unemployment rates. So my question is how we can, in practice, uh, we can avoid this conflict between the, the, the interests of the workers and yeah. the environment. And that's why probably I would, uh, the, 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 what you are trying to, 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 uh, to explain us is it, is probably needing some some is, is will need uh, further theoretical linkages yeah. and okay, so also an implication. So let me pick up on this because okay. it's an interesting issue, right? The transformation of society and the uh, employment uh, implications of it. Clearly, shutting down the fossil fuel sector means a lot of people will not be working in the fossil fuel sector. Will they be unemployed? Will they can switch into alternative sectors? That's what happens whenever we have new technologies that come along. We've seen it continuously through industrial society. New technologies come along, make people unemployed, and are they unemployed? Yes, they are, and they retrain, and they have to go. Else. If the state comes in and helps retraining, it makes it a lot easier. If you get someone like Thatcher who wants to break the unions and shut down the coal industry, then you end up with lots of high unemployment in certain regions and lots of disaffected and socially outcast people. You don't have to have that if you actually think through what you're doing and you create alternative jobs in, in society. But we have to also, I mean, part of the degrowth issue is what is it to work? What do we mean by work? What is this job? Why are we having this wage? How, why do we need to survive in a system that forces us to be these kind of wage slaves? This is also a bigger issue. But the simple practical issue is that you can plan for change and structural change in the society. And it's done all the time. I mean, you know, the war economy is quite often cited as the major one. You see a massive shift from civil production into war economy. And there's no unemployment, there's full employment. I mean, it wasn't Keynes's policy that got out of the 1930s. It was the Second World War. Massive government intervention to put everybody in the military and to create a new system of production that was around armaments. It's unfortunate that it had to be a war and it had to be armaments, but it shows you the potentiality to change a system and to do it without unemployment, the big bogeyman of the post right? Mm. Uh, thanks. Um, my point is a bit connected with, I'm very happy to hear that Yes, you have a very radical vision, but I agree with David and you that it's perhaps one of the most realistic visions we could have and that we need to have. And I'm happy to hear that you talk about institutions, political parties, trade unions, because the fact is that many times the people at the grassroots uh, resisting, it's, it's doing a, a great job and I agree with you, it's not just hippies and the example of France is pretty clear on the impact they, they may have, but it's not enough. 
and this massive transformation can only be done with governments and institutions. But I think that uh, sometimes if we only research about the, the environmental or the so you said you are no, no none of you knows about physics, okay, but perhaps the issues that not of us, not many of us know much about institutional change, institutional capacities for change. And, and, and we need political parties, we need social leaders with these visions, and I don't think uh, the, our research agendas have much on this, so what's your intake of, uh, yeah. on this? And especially, you said the only concrete example you gave us was the, the French hippies, that you said no, no hippies, but if you see any political party in the world or movement that is kind of understanding this institutional transformation that we need? Right. So, I mean, I come from an institute that's called Multi-Level Governance which means that it's not just about national politics, it's actually at all levels of governance. The environmental movement typically is focused on the local level and it fails at either, uh, it has some bioregionalism, but once you get above the region, it starts failing. And multi-level governance is about the fact you need to have structures at all these different levels, right? Multinational corporations are already international. You cannot fight an international corporation at the local level. You might fight it locally and like get rid of them from the local area, but you're not really changing them fundamentally, right? So you've got to have a whole bunch of strategies across the board. I mean, the reason it's social ecological economics and not just ecological economics is explicitly because of this need that you're raising to address the social institutions, the actors in society, the people who will be impacted. So the unions are clearly important players in this. And very important. And we, yes, we just had a demonstration in Vienna. I was on the demonstration last week. 100,000 union members and others protesting against the right-wing and neo-Nazi government that we have in Austria. And this government trying to increase the working week to 12 hours. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. They're trying to destroy the unions and they're targeting the unions. The unions should be the most uh, strong ally in this social ecological change. Unfortunately, a lot of unions are trapped in the productivist uh, growth model and they're very concerned about employment in the current system without thinking forward to what this means and what they should be thinking about as secure employment for the future. There will not be secure employment in the coal mining industry in the future, right? If they had realised that in Britain in 1970, they might have done something different. They didn't, they lost, the union was destroyed, and we had decades of right-wing and factorism and neoliberalism. Uh, so, I'll be reflecting on a um, general uh, contribution about uh, finances in developing countries. And I'll be citing the case of an uh, African country. Uh, among the 15 co uh, West African countries, I've been to 11. And I have seen the influence of the uh, ecological changes. Now, the sea has been threatening the land in the African countries. Even there have been conscious um, attempts to build rocks around the beaches to stop the sea. But the sea is increasingly expanding. There have been massive changes in our season. We don't have summer, we don't have, uh, but we have our own season. And our atmosphere is being continuously uh, uh, poisoned. We have polluted air, pollutants, and we don't have strong industrial bases like developed countries. Now, there should be support in order to mitigate this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this climate changes. But the Paris Agreement is expecting an equal share and equal contribution from our uh, head of state, which is not, uh, which is not mm -hmm. reasonable. So mm -hmm. I want to, by 2022, it is estimated that one third of Ethiopia will be wiped out by water. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what, uh, what's your take on this. Yeah. So this is the inequity in society which I'm highlighting as well in my, in my talk. And, the, uh, and this is actually part of the lie of the Paris Agreement, right? So but they're, they're not actually recommending an equitable share in this, right? So what they actually have is they have these intended uh, national contributions. So they've broken the multilateral agreement. So rather than walking you know, going down the route where we try to get everybody to agree to common targets, what you've got, everybody writes up their own targets, 
And then these are supposed to uh, get uh, more stringent over time. There's no one really looking into, they rejected from the Paris Agreement any idea of compensation for damages. There's no, uh, uh, there's no clauses that uh, they were all taken out about the migrant problem that is created by climate change. It's been known for 30 years that the delta areas in, say, Bangladesh, for example, and other areas will be flooded, where millions of people live, and that they will be displaced. This is inevitable. The small island states will disappear. This is inevitable. So these people are going to actually be looking for somewhere to go. Some of the small island states have alliances with the United States because they had bombs dropped on them by nuclear weapons. And therefore, the, uh, the after the testing of the nuclear weapons in the 1950s, and therefore the United States is actually responsible for these people. And therefore, some of, the, some of them actually will have rights to take citizenship in the United States. What about the others? And will they withdraw this right under the current types of regimes that we have? So you have real problems. And in the Paris Agreement, the problems are not addressed. They were taken out. They were put into either the first part, of, which is not part of the treaty. It's the preamble. And they're mentioned there. Or they were deleted completely. So what you see in the climate change discussions that are ongoing is that this, the nations continuously try to reintroduce issues about compensation, about climate migrants. What does this mean? Who's going to take responsibility for this? What are the nations supposed to do? What are people supposed to do when they're flooded out of their homes or their crops de are destroyed? All these things go on. And what's you can see what's happening. We're putting up the barriers. We're getting the border patrols going. We're militarizing our society. We're closing down. We're making the fences higher. And we're sending the military into these countries to keep the resources flowing. So it's not a pretty picture. Uh, we will take just one last question. Oh, last question. Um, so I, I think that you made it pretty clear that if we want to meet the Paris agreements of the 80% reductions, that's going to mean the end of capitalism as we know it. And, and so it seems like there's, there's a pretty clear, like, two different trends. Either we go into this post-capitalism world, um, and, and I think that's where a lot of the comments here have been saying, we want to know more about this. We want to have the story. We want to kind of see that. But the other trend is if we go into, like, a crisis capitalism world. And, and I think that it could be a helpful, uh, helpful strategy or rhetoric, particularly when talking to a lot of the heterodox economics community, to focus on just how bad this is actually going to be. Because I feel like that's something that I just kind of have vaguely apocalyptic notions that things will be horrible at some point for some people. A and I haven't seen or been exposed to a whole lot of really detailed and serious evidence of kind of like, here are the limits, here's where we are, here's how close we are, and this is kind of what the science says is going to be bad. And yeah. so I think that could kind of be a useful way to get a lot of the post-Keynesians and Marxists on board with sort yeah. of doing this kind of research. So I agree with you, and I think this is what we call scenario analysis as well. And it's not something that hasn't been done, it has actually been done. It was, there was a scenario report done under the IPCC some years ago. Uh, the IPCC report, I forget how many it was, it was 40 or 50 scenarios were done. They reduced them down to four, which they, they used then in their scientific predictions. These are not predictions, they're scenarios. And they were there to make people think, which is what the role of scenarios is, to think about potential futures and the susceptibility of the system to these kinds of futures. So we don't know what's going to happen. This is Keynesian strong uncertainty. Therefore, we need to have approaches for actually thinking these things through, research approaches. So I, th I would disagree with you is this is not rhetoric. This is about how we do research, and it's not <coughs> storytelling either. So scenarios, you could say they are kind of a storytelling, but they're not because they're supposed to be scientific, right? They're meant to be founded in what is feasible, what's real, how can the uh, economy and society operate, and what would happen if we pull this away, what would collapse, you know? So they were developed uh, by corporations to think about their strategic management of their companies, you know, like BP. These are not uh, storytelling. This is actually how do you make your, your corporation more robust against potential futures? And this is what we need to do. The, uh, the, the side of it, you know, looking at scenarios where you would say to get the uh, heterodox people on, we have to describe how bad things can be. Well, unfortunately, I mean, I get criticized for just painting negative stuff, right? And again, I think there's also an issue in here about the lack of funding. So you, it's very hard to get scenario analysis funding to actually look at these potentialities. But this is also something I think we can tie into critical realism. So critical realism is very well-founded science. Again, it's not 
uh, it's not storytelling or rhetorics. It's about looking at the potentialities of a system, the system we're living in, its potentials for change, its potentials for good and bad things to happen, and to try and understand the mechanisms that create the type of world we're in and how we can switch off some mechanisms and activate others. And this is a research agenda, right? And, th and knowing that there's going to be certain mechanisms that are going to get very strong, like totalitarian dictatorships, right-wing governments, militarization, <laughs> means that you have to think about how do you actually address those? How do you actually try to defuse those, to, to actually stop those mechanisms? So this is something that has to be done, right? And people are, of course, political scientists do think about this, but you're right, we need a lot more research on this. We need more people on board. And we also need to get the governments and the uh, funding agencies more serious about this, rather than just their securitization of resources and funding the military. Thank you very much.